I was always a story and content person and a people person, very interested in the dynamics of a story. I tend not to be a black and white storyteller. I'm interested in the complexity of things and in my view life unfolds in shades of gray rather than black and white. Is it easy? Are there challenges? Always. There are always obstacles, there are always challenges, and, and you learn how to deal with them. Storytelling is a part of life. People love and need stories. We all have stories to tell. I was born in Montreal in 1949. At the time, my family was living in the Cotonage area on Carleton Avenue. About 10 years old, we moved to Ville Saint Laurent. It was a great place to grow up because there were parks and there was sports and there were friends. Traditional family, I, I was an only child, so I had a lot of attention from my parents, which I guess is a, a mixed blessing, but there was a lot of love in the household. My parents were not religious, but uh, I came from a very Jewish home but we were secular by and large, but we were very traditional. We had Friday night dinners, we celebrated holidays. Um, you know, I felt very Jewish and, and, and still do. Was there something that influenced me in my career choice? Maybe, I mean, Jews are very inquisitive people. Jews ask questions. So ultimately that became my profession, asking questions and exploring ideas. As I got older, I had a lot of friends. I was very social and by and large was a kind of smiling kind of person and a fairly happy person growing up, very happy person growing up. I was very into sports. I was kind of a jock and always in the park. I enjoyed school, was not always the most disciplined student, but uh, loved being exposed to, um, to education and ideas. I went to Concordia, Loyola at the time. Yeah, I was in the arts faculty and, and studied liberal arts and humanities. Ostensibly I was studying economics and political science, but it was really a broadly based liberal arts humanities education, which I think stood me in good stead. What um, was probably the formative experience in my university education was being involved in campus life. There was a lot of political activity at the time. I was a student activist. This was the late 60s and early 70s where young people like myself were interested in changing the world and there were issues to that effect that played out on campus and I was right in the thick of it, something of a student leader. I represented students on the University Senate. I had always been involved, interested in current affairs and public affairs, followed it closely throughout from a fairly young age newspapers, magazines, uh, television, what was always very interested in the world around us. And that was an opportunity to engage in, in um, you know, university life, uh, campus politics. I identified very much with sort of the spirit of the times. There was an anti-Vietnam aspect to things. There were cultural changes going on. and. I felt right in the thick of it. And I think I kind of found myself, but I went through my years of, of uh, school, elementary school, high school, and even year, university undergraduate studies, not really knowing what I wanted to be. That came to me a bit uh, later in life. graduated in 1971 I was lucky enough to hear about a France-Canada cultural exchange uh, into which I was accepted and I went off to Paris for a year and I taught English in a lycée. You know, here I was in my early 20s, had never been outside of North America and went to Paris and it was a fantastic experience in all kinds of ways. The year came to an end and I did have that sort of moment that you're asking about where I said, well, this has been great. I'm in my early 20s, I have to give a little bit of thought to what I want to do professionally and how I'm going to earn a living. I realized that I had an interest in television and film and public affairs and maybe I could do some professional studies in that area and maybe that would lead to something. So I made a decision at the end of the year in Paris 
that I would go to London because I loved living in Europe and I was not finished with the idea of living outside of Canada. Came back to Montreal and worked and for the summer and saved money and made inquiries about where I can study. And I went back to London, turned out to be for a year, and did some academic and more importantly some professional studies in television and television production. And the second I got into it, I realized this is what I would like to do. But I did want to connect it to my interest in public affairs and current affairs. So the idea of going back and trying to work for the CBC became my focus. Well, before there was a first day, there was a lot of knocking on doors. Knocked on doors, uh, took a few small jobs, pulled cables long enough to realize that it, that wasn't the side that I was interested in. I was more interested in the content and the editorial side. But I didn't know someone who actually had been uh, someone I had been editor of uh, the campus newspaper when I was at Concordia Loyola. He was already working at the CBC. I went in and spoke to him and he said there were opportunities to do freelance work in CBC Radio. So I said, that sounds good. And I started doing that. I had one misfire where I came up with an idea and interviewed someone. And well, it wasn't the greatest thing ever done, but I had a foot in the door. People were patient. And pretty quickly, I started experiencing success there, doing radio documentaries, current affairs, broad subjects about Quebec. I had a wonderful two years freelancing in CBC Radio, and eventually, uh, for a period of time, I became the Quebec story editor for a, a terrific CBC program called uh, Morningside, or This Country in the Morning, before it was called Morningside. And I learned as I did. I learned through experience. I did not come to this with a great formation in radio or television or how to do it. I made mistakes, but fortunately people were patient and I learned from mistakes, but more than the mistakes, I think I quickly realized and fortunately other people there seemed to believe that I had talent in the area. Um, did I have doubts? Did I have challenges? Yeah, there are always challenges along the way, but I felt good about it. I felt I had the ability, the capacity, the talent to be effective in this area, and that was quickly sort of confirmed as, as, as I worked there. I worked for about two years in radio, doing freelance documentaries of all kinds. And I, again, a contact through um, Concordia Loyola days was then working in CBC television in Montreal in the current affairs department. And we spoke and it turned out there was an opportunity there. Um, and my real desire was to work in television. So I used the formation and really learning about broadcasting to transition into television, uh, CBC television in Quebec. And um, boy, I jumped right in the deep end and it was great. It was stimulating. I loved the world of public affairs and current affairs. I continue to learn how to tell stories, how to produce television programs, how to interact with people, how to do location shoots. I directed in studio. You know, the early days freelancing in CBC radio and working in CBC television, to me, was magical. I remember working one night at the CBC in radio, editing a radio documentary. And it was late at night and I was not looking at my watch, sort of saying, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock at night. Uh, what am I still doing here? I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. It's 11 o'clock at night, I'm in the CBC in a little editing room, and I'm, I'm editing a documentary. And then I knew, you know, that I was in the right place at the right time, and I had found my calling. Late, in my career at the CBC. I, I got married in a year, a little over a year after I got married, um, my wife became pregnant. 
and that coincided. I was working at the time uh, on the journal at CBC Television, and they wanted me to come and move to Toronto to take a senior role in the program oversight to become a senior producer on, on the journal, which was a great series headed by a legendary Canadian broadcaster called Barbara Frum. And that became a big life issue because here I was, uh, you know, with a child on the way and my wife, who was pregnant, was very insecure about leaving Montreal under those circumstances. She didn't feel she knew anyone, what if we need support, or, I mean, for me it was kind of the right thing to do. But then we even went as far as going and looking for a house in Toronto and accommodation and all of that. So we took it pretty seriously. And at the end of the day, she sort of prevailed and sort of said, no, let's stay in Montreal. So some combination of her prevailing and maybe feeling it was time to spread my wings um, professionally, I left to become an independent uh, person documentary filmmaker, producer, so on and so forth, not fully having a strategy as to what I was going to do and how I was going to earn a living with a new child on the way. But I got out there and again, just like I did in the beginning, I, I beat the bushes. learned that there was a series at the National Film Board of Canada here in Montreal about Canadian authors. I went in there to network. I was a pretty good networker. Met the executive producer at the series. By then I had a good track record. And he said, um, yes, we have the series on Canadian authors and not everybody has been done and we're looking for new ideas. And I said, well, has Mordecai Richler been done? And he said, no, that would be a great idea. And I guess I had the credibility as a documentary filmmaker that we very quickly moved forward. And that was the opportunity to do my first independently produced documentary, uh, kind of full length documentary and a very exciting opportunity it was because um, I, I loved Mordecai Richler's writing it captured something about my reality, coming from Montreal and coming from the Montreal Jewish community. I loved uh, him as a satirist. I was a fan of his nonfiction. But this doesn't mean it was a glowing love letter to Mordecai. Here for personal reasons, or are you here on behalf of Canadian writers? I've always wanted to meet the children of privilege. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Richler may be entertaining, he may be informative. If you are also, though, uh, asking for a moral core to literature, which is very important to me, um, I would say that there is a, a certain degree of tastelessness. Jews, French Canadians, you know, he was an equal opportunity offender, which was great. I mean, you look, when you do this, it's, it's not intended to be a promotional film. I took the time to develop my ideas about his work and his writing and his personality. I had family responsibilities, had to earn a living, but I took a chance. And I think very often in life, if you don't take a chance, you don't move forward in ways that you want to move forward in. I started working on my own, so I formed a little company. I think it was originally called Allen Handel Productions, subsequently became Handel Productions. And it really existed for the films that I was doing um, as a producer, director and writer. Um, in fact, it may not have even been a corporation for the first years that I was working independently, but then it became an incorporated production company for all kinds of reasons. And for many, many years, um, it existed for the films that I did. Then at a certain point in time, when I decided to grow the company, play a different role as an executive producer, I became the head of a production company that was going out there and bringing in projects and working with other talent. And it went from doing my films to when we were busy doing three or four or five projects, you know, in, in a year, which was very demanding. So it was never a big company, but it was a, I thought, a very strong boutique production company and we had a, a very good, very good team inside Handel Productions. I, I hired well or was lucky enough to find good people and we ran a tight ship 
and people were passionate and they were positive and um, it became a very respected it became a very respected company in Canada and internationally. Is it easy? Are there challenges? Always. There are always obstacles, there are always challenges, and that kind of comes with the turf. And you learn how to deal with them. I was asked to do a documentary report for Dateline on the long distance trucker trucking industry and the violation of the hours of service regulations, which was kind of widely known that they were violated. And we set out to look at that and there was an incident where uh, a trucker had fallen asleep at the wheel and crashed into a toll plaza and killed a couple of young people and that precipitated this story. And there were incidents of truckers falling asleep at the wheel. Not that many, but just a few is too many. So we found a company in Maine that agreed to be part of this program and they were kind of whistleblowers of what was going on in the industry and the trucker allowed us to film a trip across America from Salinas, California all the way back to Maine, driving it the way he would normally drive it, which was not getting as much of the mandated rest as he was supposed to. At a certain point in time, I think, um, he had second thoughts about being a whistleblower. One of the reasons being that along the way, he was stopped and, and, and given a mandatory drug test. He tested positive for the use of marijuana and amphetamines while he was doing this cross-country trucking trip. So that changed his position <laughs> in terms of how he was cooperating or not, because that was information we felt that we had to report as a part of the story. It did go to trial, and NBC was fully committed to defending this story that we all knew to be accurate. We had videotape that backed up everything that had been said and so on and so forth. You know, when something goes to trial, the outcome is never certain. This was a trial by jury, which was the choice of, of uh, the trucker and the company. And the truth of the matter is that a jury of his local peers from Bangor, Maine, decided to side with them, rather what we believe to be uh, factually accurate and, and well told and, and well presented in the story that we did. And we all thought it was an outrageous decision and fortunately NBC had the means to go to the appellate court in Boston who looks at the trial the evidence, the testimony, and this is a panel of three judges, and when they looked at that, they reversed the decision. And we weren't surprised by that because our reporting had been accurate. But again, your work is on the line. It's under scrutiny. There are the consequences to your reputation, to the broadcaster of being found guilty, of being inaccurate, or having libeled someone. So those were challenging moments in my career. But from that moment on, I always worked with the assumption that whatever I was doing could be ultimately subject to extreme scrutiny and even a legal action. And it was just a kind of a learning experience. You have to learn. And, um, but at the end of the day, to me, it's about the story. I've been generating story ideas all my professional life. It's hard for me to read a newspaper in the morning without thinking about what may, might make a good film or a good program. And as they used to say, it used to call it scalped newspapers, and rarely a day or two would go by that I wasn't clipping out an article. I still do, being a dinosaur. But uh, yeah, so you have an idea. You've read a newspaper. You say, ooh, that could be good documentary. I think it's got all kinds of potential. So in my case, I asked myself two questions. Can it be a great film, or at least an interesting film, and can it be financed? And the can it be financed suggests, or, or the question is really, are there, is there a broadcaster in Canada 
and elsewhere that would be interested in buying in advance this film. So there's the commercial and business side of it which has to work out. But on the assumption you believe you can do that, you then get into developing the story. Say that's a good idea. You may commission some research and have an experienced researcher sort of bring in information. Oh, is there a story there? If so, what is the story? Um, are there good characters? Oh, can it sustain an hour? What is the potential of this story? And then at a certain point in time, if you feel you have something that's worth pitching, by pitching I mean pitching it to a broadcaster, you will do that. Well, the pitch has to be effective. It's very competitive. You have to convince a broadcaster that's probably getting 15 or 20 pitches for every idea that they commission um, that yours is the one that they should do. Hopefully you get uh, a broadcaster on board and now the process advances. They may put development money into it. They say, well that's a good idea but I don't know enough yet. So I'm going to uh, give you $10,000 to get a team working on it. So you work through the development stage, you shape the story, you explore its potential, you go back to the broadcaster and you get a sense of whether they're prepared to move ahead. To me, the tools have always been something that you use to tell a story. We worked through a lot of changes from the technology that we use to how you reach audiences and how people see things from <laughs> small uh, television sets to moving into high definition to moving into 4K, the magic of CGI. It's a powerful, powerful tool that can bring alive in terms of films I've done, Pompeii, when I say bring alive, go back and show what it was like back then through this magical uh, technology. Uh, I did a film on dinosaurs. 40 minutes you were in the world, the last day of the dinosaurs it is a photo reel film that looks at the day and the lead up to the day that the comet hit the earth and wiped out a lot of the dinosaur population. It's, it's movie magic. It, it's now a very important part of uh, factual storytelling. I distinguish between documentaries, of which I've done many. I've done factual series, you know, for History Channel, Discovery, so on and so forth. I did a film called uh, Pearl Harbor The Accused, another historical film where we could combine drama reconstruction with uh, CGI and bring alive the world at that time. Now there's a whole other range of tools at your disposal that has changed the, the nature of how you can tell stories as well as audience expectations about how stories will be told. So it's been, very, it's been fun and very exciting to be part of that uh, transformation. I look back now um, on my career and say I was very, very lucky to have had over 40 years of a professional career and it's still not finished that I found so satisfying and stimulating. There were challenges along the way of all kinds. However, you know, I dealt with those obstacles. I think what, what advice uh, would have I given myself um, hmm, earlier on? Continue to be as ambitious as you can be in terms of the storytelling, in terms of your career, in terms of your goals and aspirations. I'd like to be known for my tennis game, but I don't think that's particularly interesting to you. But seriously, um, I like to be known for the films, for the quality of the storytelling. I like to be known for the passion and the commitment that I put into pretty much every film, whether I directed it, wrote it, produced it, executive produced it. I was very serious and very committed to making sure that it was as good as it could be. I was driven by passion and caring. And I'd like to be known for integrity, as having functioned as a guy that, that operated with integrity.
because if you don't have fire in the belly, it's probably better to sell insurance. It's not the easiest profession, but it's certainly amongst the most satisfying and something that has made life incredibly interesting.